factual errors. There were, she told the patients, I don't know exactly where they are, so I really can't respond directly. I'm curious to hear what those are, but I don't know what they are. I'm sorry, say that again, the page? I'm sorry. Um, she gave in her opening testimony that there were uh, errors, factual errors in my, which I don't know where those are, but she made a list of page numbers. I see. So I just want to say I, I can't really respond directly to what those may have been, but I've heard her say that there were some errors. Would you like her to come up and give you those page numbers? Um, I don't know if that's best use right now. Let's okay. see how the rest of this goes. Let's but see. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to say is, um, in my opening statement, I made a few comments about vested rights. I mean, you've heard testimony about vested rights. If, in fact, they had vested rights, there wouldn't be a need for parents. There wouldn't be any trainees. They'd have the rights to be there. That would be an argument held elsewhere. That would be the building and safety. So the fact that what I, as the decision maker, the ZA, you've heard testimony about the uh, hearing. It was a three-hour hearing, I think. And, um, Everyone behaved, I made sure of that. Right. Um, and I listened intently to all of the testimony, but whenever I hear testimony about the vested rights, I, I, in my own reaction to it, say, that's not what's before me, and I don't think that's what's before you. What's before us is um, the property was rezoned. We talked about that earlier. You see one to three, that's a R3. The current zone doesn't allow for a hotel use. The current CFO has it as an apartment house. The um, um, the vested rights issue would be a by right question. What we, is before us starts with the zone variance. If the use, if we can't make the findings, we can't grant them the use, and that's what's before us. So what I'm saying is, um, if the case is, is moved because it doesn't, it's not needed. That's I think that parallels the argument. If the case that is before us starts with the zone variance, and then the, then the other ancillary components of it, can we make the findings? So I start right there making the five required findings. And I could not make them, I don't think they can be made. Um, so that's the very first thing. There were some other discussions about the Coastal Use and the Coastal Act. Um, this, pro the, this the subject property is an area that's designated for residential, medium density residential uses. So there's an awful lot about the Coastal and its access, and you, you guys know the Coastal Act pretty darn well. But you know, various component, uh, provisions that were discussed briefly and called out. But um, again, if the use is not supposed to be there because the zoning doesn't allow it by right and we can't make the findings to get it there through, through a variance, I don't think the coastal uh, uh, um, findings can be made as well. So that's a direct train of thought for me. Um, and then the last thing, and this also came from my, well, there's two things. Um, I want to uh, talk about the, um, uh, the permits. I went all the way through the, the permit history as well as I could. I couldn't find the, the 1921 original, but I found uh, quite a few. I, I was rather pleased to be able to do that. I found 1926, 34, 35, 36, 37, 39, and 40. All of those referred to this as an apartment house. The 52, and maybe I thought I saw part of the presentation that was caught my attention over there, but there was, you know, there was a discussion, I think, about the um, uh, different types of uh, permits and acknowledged uses. Uh, the 1952 permit that was discussed um, called it a hotel, but that permit, the actual scope of that work, wasn't a change of use or anything else that would lead to a CFO of any kind. That was to alter the pair of balls along Oceanfront Walk and Speedway. That was done by a masonry contractor. I thought that was interesting that they chose to do that, but that's what they did in 52. Most interesting thing that followed that is in 54, that permit called an apartment house again. Is this a changing use oscillating in two years, or is this just a contractor who threw it out there and it really didn't matter because it was an over the counter kind of a permit? I can't, I don't, wasn't there, et cetera, but let the record speak. Um, then in 1958, another permit came out, and that one actually called out apartment house. You can go to the, no, I don't know what those words are showing. At any rate, that, the permit from 1958 um, specifically wrote down apartment house. It almost looks like they did it in pencil, because you can see this cross out, and then it says hotel next to it, and the scope of work on that, sandblasting. <laughs> Over the counter, not the type of thing that would get you to what I would argue would be evidence of a hotel. So I just wanted to put that out there, because these permits from 52 and 58 have been uh, referenced in the appellant's material. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention is, well, combined, I 
Mr. Lambert is, is in the community and he's got supporters and he's got all naysayers, but doing good work, being well liked or disliked, we're talking about a land use decision. So I want to I want to kind of focus this back to the idea of needing to make the findings if we're going to grant the variance. Starting point. I, I can't make them, I don't think they can be made. And I also suggested in my opening uh, comments that there are other pathways. If indeed people believe that in 1989, that the AB 283 efforts to bring consistency went the wrong direction by making it consistent with the residential designation, or even think that errors were made. Um, one person testified about a, a completely different piece of property, but where they believe there was an error. There are correction ordinances available. Someone could have and ought to have petitioned to have those corrected if they were bona fide errors. If you disagree with the legislative act, that's, the, that's, that's the, the city council. They have the legislative authority to do those things. Um, so that's just a few comments about errors, if you will. Sure. Um, then I want to comment on the changing zone from a commercial to a residential. If you are legally there when something like that happens, you have what becomes non-conforming rights. You're not forced out. You get to stay. You may change your options, but I think the idea that you are forced out off the property is not an accurate, I mean, out of a commercial use, is not an accurate statement. So the last thing I wanted to say is, if you can't get a variance, there's another way to propose all this. There's testimony that we only that we only have, I forgot what the number was, a very nominal uh, number of, uh, of uh, hotel rooms in Venice, but a huge visiting population with all sorts of benefits and activity and vibrancy you heard all that. Um, and that other communities, maybe Santa Monica or whatever, are offering up all those hotels and that there is a need for more hotels, the applicant or the community or during the update could propose, literally, re rezoning this and redesignating all this. So if you can't make the findings on a variance, I think you have to sustain what I've done. I've thought this through really carefully. Um, but it does preclude another avenue potentially get to a yes or get to all the findings necessary to allow the use to be there via a zone change plan amendment, suddenly everything would follow when they went to do that with the coastal development findings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to make those comments about process, if you will. Um, otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions at all spawn. Commissioner Marlins. Commissioner Marlins, is that Mr. Weintraub or Julia Rivers the best person to answer this regarding the fellow? So we heard testimony this afternoon about um, about the process of the Mellon review about two potentially different ways of looking at it. The one, um, I think it was very clear in the letter that was submitted from HCID about um, the history of rental rates in this building, but I didn't seem to see much information regarding the, um, the process of the IAP at evaluating change of use and whether it's a coastal dependent use or feasibility of residential use. Um, so I have a feeling I might know what the answer is, but could you please um, give us uh, an official answer from the city side? Sure, Julio, City Kwani. Um, the steps we typically take in a case like this where there is a change of use is to, to go through the steps of the IAP. The first question, um, and I'm just gonna read from the, the IAP is, will residential structures be demolished or converted for purposes of a non-residential use? So um, the project is to convert an existing apartment house into an apartment hotel. Um, by de definition of our code, an apartment hotel is a residential building. Um, but for the purposes of the Mellow Act, what we take into consideration is um, how those residential units will be used. So um, if you look at the definition of a residential unit under the IAP and the Mellow Act, um, if, if a guest room is used as a, a, per, a primary residence or permanent residence, it's considered a residential unit. If it's used for transient purposes, then it's not considered a residential unit. Um, the way this question is phrased, will residential structures be demolished or converted for pur purposes of a non-residential use, doesn't speak to residential units, it asks what the use would be. So in this question, the city's answer was, no, it's going from, a, from an apartment house containing 32 dwelling units to an apartment hotel comprised of two dwelling units and 30 guest rooms. So um, in this question, the city did not require a feasibility study to, to be submitted. So the next step for this project 
was to determine, was for housing to determine if there are any affordable residential units there. Um, housing did their review based on the rent rules submitted by the property owner. And um, they came to the conclusion that there are no existing affordable residential units. Ms. Commissioner Marius, maybe I missed something. I could have sworn what I just heard was you said that uh, for the purposes of the mellow, if uh, if a unit is used for transient purposes, such as a short-term rental or rental, that qualifies as a commercial use. Is that what you said? No, not as a commercial use. It's not considered a residential unit. So the question is asking about the structure. The structure itself is going to be a residential structure, but in terms of the applicability of this question to this project, um, the existing structure contains 32 dwelling units, 32 residential units. The proposed development would contain two residential units and 30 guest rooms. So based on that, a residential use would still exist at, as part of the proposed project. This is commercial, this is commercial margulis, but only two out of 32. I mean, it seems to me what's happening is there's two units which would, make, would um, persist as residential units, but 30 units would now be commercial units because they're transient temporary short-term rentals. Again, the definitions in the code don't speak to commercial, um, that, the, that the hotel would be a commercial use. We're strictly speaking, will it, will it be a residential unit? How, so, how can a commercial, how can a hotel that's a commercial use be a residential use at the same time? It's a residential building. So um, I guess what would make it, uh, what we want to focus on is the definition of a residential unit. So for the purposes of the Mellow Act, a residential unit is a dwelling unit, or it could be a guest room if that's it's, if it's meant for long-term occupancy. That's so the point.